So to start off, I have two questions. First question, is anyone weather, what the weather's gonna be tomorrow? Not too long ago, it was 70 degrees, and I had to find clothes that wouldn't melt me. A few days later, I was putting on as many layers as I humanly could so I wouldn't freeze into a person sickle. <laughs> My second question is a little bit different, though. Has anybody ever wondered what's inside of a black hole? That's good. <laughs> so a black hole is an infinitely dense point some stars leave behind after exploding in a supernova. And its gravity is so strong that if anything gets too close to it, even its atoms will be ripped apart in a process called spaghettification. So I start off with these two things to show just how hard it is to answer some of the most fundamental questions about our universe. It's hard to predict the weather. It's hard to know when it will rain and when it won't. And at the same time, it's hard to crack open a black hole and see what's inside. It's even harder to think about how they bend space and time, warping everything we understand as normal. They're so alien that I still can't wrap my head around them. But just because things are weird, just because questions about them may be hard, doesn't mean that I don't ask. And actually, we all ask these questions, really difficult questions, about the nature of our world. Why is the sky blue? Why were dinosaurs so big? Are we alone in the universe? As a species, we're driven by our curiosity. We want to learn more, to know, to know more. But what happens when our questions get too big, or too complex, or too weird? What happens when we want to explore, but our destination is too far away, but too dangerous? To tell my story, about a computer simulation. I first need to explain dark matter. So dark matter is shy. It likes to keep to the shadows, and I mean that literally. It doesn't emit, absorb, or reflect light in any way, which means no matter how fancy we make our telescopes, we will never see it. But we know it's there because of its gravity, how it subtly pulls on and shapes galaxies. We also know that it seems to be everywhere making up 84% of all the matter in the universe. That means the stuff you're used to. The chairs are sitting in this stage. This normal matter makes up less than 20% of all the stuff in existence. It's kind of embarrassing for astronomers to not know what the universe is made of. So for the past few decades, they've been trying to figure it out. They've had physicists help them by smashing particles at almost the speed of light. They've filled caverns with mineral oil and photo detectors. They've launched special probes into space to try and understand what dark matter is. But we still don't know. Now, a few years ago, a new theory began to turn some heads. And astronomers had gotten together and asked a very important question. They asked, what do we know for sure about dark matter? Turns out the answer was, we know that it's dark and it interacts with gravity. Then they asked another question. They asked, what do we know for sure about black holes? Turns out the answer was, they're dark and they interact with gravity. And that is how the primordial black hole as dark matter hypothesis was born. And this hypothesis that no, dark matter is not some sort of mysterious particle we've never encountered before. Dark matter is actually made up of really small black holes that formed at the beginning of the universe. So this past summer, I took all the dark matter in a galaxy, and I turned it into black holes. But full disclosure, this galaxy was not real, but it did exist. This galaxy lived in a computer simulation, and I turned all of its virtual dark matter into virtual black holes. But what I did was strange. It was weird, because in thousands of years that we have been looking at the stars, astronomers have never been able to experiment. They made observations and predictions, very accurate predictions, of when and where the sun would rise, when and where eclipses would be visible, when and where the planets would appear. But they could never experiment. Unlike chemists who could combine elements on compounds to study their properties, unlike physicists, 
who could set up systems of weights and pulleys to study forces. Astronomers can never induce a supernova to study the death of stars. Astronomers can never smash two galaxies together to study how they merge. But now with computers, with the power to create virtual worlds filled with virtual gas and virtual stars, we can induce that supernova. We can merge those black holes, merge those galaxies. And so, as I let my black holes get bigger in my little galaxy, I kept track of how much they were eating. Why did I care? Why did I care about how much my black holes were accreting? Because contrary to popular belief, black holes can and do shine. As gas spirals inwards towards them, it starts to go faster and faster, and, as it's, and it starts to glow. And this glowing gas causes the black hole to shine, sometimes even outshining the brightest star. So I let my black holes get bigger. I let them grow. I figured out how much mass they were eating, turned some of that mass into energy, and I knew exactly how much they would shine. As I did this, I took a moment to reflect. I had modeled a galaxy that didn't exist. I had turned dark matter into black holes, and I had experimented with the very fundamental nature of our universe. Our ability to understand the world around us is not limited by our imagination. It is limited by the tools and methods we can use to explore it. But now, because we have computers, the questions that were once too big, too complex, too weird for scientists to comprehend are now within our grasp. And I don't just mean for astronomy either. Never before have we been able to know exactly how a protein will fold. Never before have we been able to know how complex systems of machines will interact. Never before have we been able to know when it will rain. Computer simulations gave us the ability to create virtual worlds and those virtual worlds allowed us to better understand our real one. So as I looked at my black holes, 108 of them stood out to me. They shined, yes, they were bright, but they were really bright. They outshone the sun by factors of hundreds. And so as we continue to search for what dark matter is, as we continue to discover, we can keep an eye out for a black hole shining. As we turn our telescopes to ever more distant galaxies, we can keep watch for a black hole acting as dark matter. But now the primordial black hole as dark matter hypothesis is just that, it's a hypothesis, it's a guess. It's a very basic guess, but it is a guess based on physics that govern both real and simulated worlds. And most importantly, it is a guess we could not have made without computers. Now the goal of my talk is not to teach you how a computer simulation functions. I am grossly underqualified for that. The goal of my talk is also not to teach you astrophysics. There are scientists and professors who can speak much more deeply and eloquently on this subject. The goal of my talk is to share my experience as a high school student with a computer simulation, to share how it captivated my curiosity allowed me to experience the ordinary, extraordinary without leaving the ordinary of my daily life. Computer simulations allow us to climb the highest mountains, swim the deepest seas, and visit the furthest stars. They speak to our most human instinct for discovery. Because we can imagine something, we can model it. If we can model it, we can understand it. The virtual worlds we build remind us just how much mystery and beauty there is left for us to ponder. And these worlds created in ones and zeros show us just how sublime, enigmatic, and intricate our world truly is. Thank you. <laughs>